This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. The month of September was very trying for many countries as far as large-scale emergencies caused by natural disasters were concerned. Hurricanes, earthquakes and floods have made landfalls in the United States, in several islands of the Caribbean and in Mexico, claiming hundreds of lives, triggering massive evacuations, leaving devastated cities and regions to rebuild, and billions of dollars in damage. As climate change continues to be on the rise, large-scale natural disasters should be expected. Many people around the world do not know what to expect, how to respond, where to go, what to do and what to avoid, should that community be hit with a massive disaster. Today's Perspective on Global Justice episode will examine some aspects of the disaster management practices used in Japan, which is one of the most successful countries in the world for natural disasters. Over the years, Japan has been hit very hard in educating, preparing citizens to respond to and to survive large-scale emergencies came standard practice. This kind of readiness is crucial, given the neighbors are the first ones to arrive and to respond to an emergency. Not to mention that the government may be unable to meet the needs of the community due to its limited capacity and resources. Today, we're very fortunate to have Robin Lewis as our guest. He's the international coordinator for the Peace Boat, an NGO with consultative status in the United Nations. Robin's work is focused on disaster response, training programs to build disaster resiliency and UN-related projects. On that note, welcome to our program, darling. <laughs> Hello, Beatrice. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. So, uh, Robin, uh, to our viewers who do not know about you, do you mind giving a little background, background about yourself uh, professionally and uh, where are you based at? Sure. So, uh, I'm based here in Tokyo, uh, Japan. Um, I'm half Japanese and half British, um, and I grew up kind of between uh, Japan and the UK. Um, in 2011, um, I started working in, in the field of disaster response um, after the 2011 uh, tsunami in Japan. So that was kind of one of the, the big turning points in my life. Um, and since the tsunami, um, I've been working both in Japan uh, and in countries like Haiti, uh, Nepal, uh, Vanuatu, uh, several different contexts. Uh, in disaster risk reduction and response. Yes, and I had the honor and privilege of meeting you very brief period of time in Hawaii back in 2015. And uh, um, I was quite impressed uh, with the work that Peace, Peace Boat does, uh, not only in the area of disaster preparedness, but also nuclear uh, disaster uh, efforts you know, for disarmament and also the peace message that it carries. Um, so a lot is happening in the world, uh, and uh, unfortunately, due to climate changes, we're seeing more and more natural disasters. Um, but I wanted to start our program uh, with a really lovely um, story that you shared in an article that you wrote not so long ago titled Japan, Catfish and the Need for Disaster Preparedness. Do you mind sharing with our viewers uh, the catfish story in Japan? <laughs> sure. So um, if you walk around Tokyo, you'll see um, symbols of catfish in some of the main roads. Um, and the reason for this is that, uh, according to Japanese mythology, um, earthquakes are caused by a giant catfish called the Namazu, the Namazu catfish. And uh, this creature lurks under the Earth's surface. And, and basically, when the catfish, the Namazu, uh, shakes its tail, um, it causes uh, earthquakes. So, you know, many, many uh, moons ago, a long time ago, uh, people believed that the catfish was the, the cause of, of earthquakes. I see. So uh, it's a really uh, sweet mythology to keep in mind, you know, as we are dealing with more and more natural disasters. Uh, but we also know that 
there's a little bit more to that <laughs> than the catfish. Um, <laughs> but one of the reasons why I um, invited you to be our guest today is um, the wisdom that not only you have learned in your role with the Peace Boat, but also <clears throat> the historical um, wisdom that uh, Japan and uh, Japanese citizens had to learn, unfortunately, the hard way on how to prepare for disaster of many kinds, from nuclear disasters to earthquakes to tsunamis. And I know you've been on the trench of it for at least six years. Uh, so do you mind uh, sharing with our viewers a little bit of the three components of uh, disaster management used in Japan? Sure. So uh, in the disaster management field in Japan, um, there are three elements that are kind of interlinked. Um, they are called jijo, which means uh, self-reliance. Uh, there's kyojo, which means community support. And then there's kojo, which means government assistance. So there are three elements, and they all are heavily interrelated, and heavily interconnected. Um, so the idea is that, you know, with jijo, self-reliance, people themselves are prepared for the worst. They should have, uh, in, you know, in theory, people should have um, the basic things they need to survive. They should have a, a plan together um, and they should, you know, do things like securing furniture and so on. Um, in the second element, there's kyojo, which means, you know, community support. So that means helping your neighbor, essentially. You know, whether if you have someone living with a disability next door, if you have someone who may be elderly next door, you know exactly, you know, where they are and, and, and how to assist them in times of, of emergency. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, there's, there's kojo, which of course is, is uh, government assistance, things like the fire department, police, uh, and other government-led services. So in an ideal world, if those three elements can, and can uh, be strong and kind of interact well, um, then we should have a, a resilient uh, society and we should be able to, to deal with, with emergencies. Right. And so uh, September is, I think, National Disaster Awareness Month for Japan. Uh, do you mind telling our viewers what does that look like in terms of activities uh, that both individuals, communities and the government prepares to emphasize the need uh, of uh, being prepared for disasters and emergencies? Sure. So uh, the 1st of September every year is, is National Disaster Prevention Day uh, in Japan. Uh, and the reason it's held on this day is that uh, on the 1st of September 1923, there was uh, a very big earthquake uh, around the Tokyo area called the Great Kanto Earthquake, um, which actually killed over 100,000 people. It's a very large earthquake. Um, and so every, every year on the 1st of September and, and around that time, um, there are several um, activities to basically help citizens uh, prepare for the next disaster. Um, just to provide some context, you know, Japan uh, is currently um, preparing for, you know, two or at least two major disasters. Uh, the first is called uh, the Nankai Trough uh, earthquake, um, and that would generate a very big tsunami uh, just south of Tokyo. Um, and th the government is also preparing for something called the Tokyo Inland Earthquake, um, which again will be a very, very big event um, right under the capital. Um, so there is a very uh, strong need for people to be prepared. Um, so in the month of September, you know, especially towards the beginning of the month, um, there are all kinds of activities, you know, ranging from um, school drills uh, to community uh, emergency drills. Uh, lots of festivals um, to basically p get people to, to have, you know, simple conversations about, you know, what do we do if there's an earthquake? Where do we go? Um, do we have enough food? Do we have enough water? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a really a wide range of programs happening um, across Japan during this time. Right. So um, did things change uh, in terms of rethinking disaster preparedness and management after the tsunami in 2011 and then the Fukushima nuclear disaster that happened in Japan? 
Yeah, I, th I think, you know, as you mentioned earlier, um, Japan is seen as really one of one of the global leaders in disaster management. You know, we have so much uh, investment in infrastructure. We have some of the world's best, you know, emergency services and disaster management professionals. Um, but, you know, with the 2011 earthquake and tsunami and, and the Fukushima nuclear crisis, we saw that, you know, no system is flawless. You know, there are always um, areas of weakness uh, and, you know, in, in the case of the tsunami, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, we learnt it, or the people uh, who were affected learnt it uh, the hard way, as, as you mentioned. Um, and, and so what we saw was, you know, the government buildings and several government services were were actually affected themselves. So, you know, if you go to the, the coastal areas which were hit hardest by the tsunami, Several of the, the government agencies and, and local authorities were um, unable to respond or severely um, hampered in their response. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, especially right in the in the beginning, the, the emphasis in many ways was in was on the, the community and, and the people themselves. Um, so, you know, I think one of the big lessons is, you know, yes, the government is there and yes, they are well, very well prepared. But that doesn't always mean that, that you can rely 100 percent on the government. Um, you know, we as citizens have to be ready and, and have to have a plan um, for ourselves as well. Right. So that's one of the key lessons. And I, I think another lesson was that, you know, it's, it's too late to have conversations after the fact, after earthquakes happen. We need to be having conversations and building um, strategic partnerships you know, between government, between the private sector, between NGOs. Um, well before these things happen, mm -hmm. so that when they happen, we are in a good position to respond. So we're looking also from a standpoint of prevention, and um, I want to see if we can link uh, that thought uh, with Peace Boat mission on providing disaster management response training. Uh, how is that uh, looking like across the globe? And uh, how are NGOs and the private sector responding to, you know, the call for uh, such big need, you know, to be implemented in different areas? Sure. So uh, I can give one example from uh, Peace Boat's activities. Um, we have a, a household um, level disaster preparedness training program, which um, essentially targets families. So we found that, you know, if you're at work, there's usually some kind of plan at the workplace. If you're at school, there's uh, the school should have an emergency response plan. Um, but if you're at home or if you're all, you know, if you're scattered, uh, if your loved ones are scattered, then there's a real problem because there's no um, synchronized um, plan. So we thought, you know, why don't we target family and, and help them make their own disaster plan so that when something happens, um, they know exactly where to go. And they can also take very, uh, we, we help them to take simple steps to prepare them for emergencies. You know, one example uh, in terms of statistics is that roughly 30 to 50 percent of injuries and fatalities uh, in earthquakes here occur from falling furniture, you know, 30 to 50 percent. So if you can just secure some of your basic, you know, furniture around the house, then you can greatly increase your chance of surviving uh, and responding effectively to disasters. So we help families to basically come up with their own plan, you know, discuss, you know, where to go, what we need to buy before these things happen, um, and how we can take simple measures around the house to reduce the risks. Right. So we're going to take a minute break and I'll be right back. Sure. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day.
Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Contelmo, and uh, we are having a conversation with Robin uh, Lewis. So, Robin, uh, you were talking about uh, how Peace Boat prepares uh, families and individuals to uh, come up with their own individual uh, emergency and disaster preparedness plan. Uh, so provision for food and water is very important, uh, being able to find safe uh, areas within their home or, or communities also, an area that's identified. Um, do you mind sharing um, with our viewers what you have learned as you have been deployed to so many areas after uh, natural disasters occurred? and uh, none of that was in place. Um, what were the things that you you saw that you you think it could be prevented or that you wish people would know ahead of time? Sure. So um, recently, actually over the past month or so, uh, I did a, a project called Explore Tohoku. Now, Tohoku um, is the name of the area in the northeast of Japan that was hit by the tsunami. And um, the idea was for me to basically walk around the area and interview survivors of the tsunami. Uh, and one of you know one of the the overarching themes, the, the recurring um, themes and concepts that came up from these interviews was this idea of, of tsunami tendenko. It's a Japanese concept, which basically means people have to look after themselves in in emergency situations, specifically. When the tsunami hit in 2011, um, there were many people who went home. You know, they were after, between the earthquake and the tsunami, there was a period of you know, roughly 45 minutes. And several people um, went back to their homes, which were in, you know, the danger zone. And as a result of that, um, you know, whether it's because they were they wanted to check on their kids or they wanted to pick up their, their loved ones, um, several people um, were, were killed because of that. So with this idea of, of tenden core, which is a Japanese concept, the idea is that people should scatter and basically just everyone should head up to uh, a safe area by themselves and not worry about the other family. So if you know that your family members will also you know, make their own way to high ground, then there's no need for, for people to go back into to, um, sort of dangerous areas. So that's one one key key message that I kept hearing. Another one is is with complacency, and I think uh, interestingly, you know, before the tsunami in 2011, I think just the week before there was another tsunami warning um, that didn't result in tsunami. Tsunami. There was an earthquake somewhere, and you know, people were were you know getting prepared. They they ran to high ground. And then nothing happened. And so when the 2011, the March 11th, the big one happened, the tsunami then, um, people, again, some people thought, oh, it's just another, you know, it's, it can't be that bad because last time um, there was no tsunami. So I think, you know, regardless of the situation, if there is uh, some kind of warning from the local authority, you should always follow that instruction and always take all the, all the measures you can to get to safety. Right. Well, that's, you know, really amazing to hear in, uh, as a pearls of wisdom, you know, the people who had survived both the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, I, I, I remember you actually wrote another article um, with six things not to do during an earthquake. So yes. I, 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 to be quite honest with you, there were certain things here I was surprised. And I have been certified to not only respond to emergencies through our national system uh, in the United States, through FEMA. Uh, on that, I was like, wow, there's always something to learn here. So <laughs> really quickly on that, because I, you know, I think Hawaii is one of those places, like last week alone, uh, we had two earthquakes, uh, not so large a magnitude, it was like four, 
0.1 for one and 4.2 for another. But like Japan, we're also in an area that's quite prone to natural disasters. And I always say to people, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we get to hit uh, with something and we need to get prepared. Uh, but I thought that those six points that you brought up were quite ingenious. So the first one was, do not use a car to evacuate an area after an earthquake. Why is that, Ruben? <laughs> <laughs> so again, this is uh, I think quite specific to Japan. So you know, some of these these uh, these tips may work in Japan, and some of them may work in other contexts as well. Um, the reason that this is actually a tip from uh, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government mm -hmm. is um, because Tokyo and, and other you know urban areas are so densely populated. If everyone tries to evacuate uh, in their cars, then there would be serious traffic jams. And actually, this happened in 2011 as well. You know, people tried to evacuate in their cars, got stuck in traffic, and as a result, uh, they were they were killed by the tsunami. So, um, as a rule of thumb, you know, the, the people say it's best to evacuate on foot to high ground, uh, specifically. Um, yeah, after earthquakes and tsunamis. Mm -hmm. But this may vary, you know, depending on the context. Right. Well, I can't imagine that this is actually wisdom for many places in the world because we do not know the conditions of the roads and the gems, you know, that uh, will be appearing to. Uh, so maybe stay foot or try to go by foot to the mountain, Malka side. <laughs> it's not a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> Uh, so then the second one was uh, do not walk around your home uh, barefoot uh, or on socks. <laughs> yeah, this this is probably, again, just common sense, but in the case of major earthquakes, there's a lot of glass that can uh, can obviously shatter and go on the floor. So one of the most common earth, um, post-earthquake injuries is cuts to feet. So, you know, one of the things that we do suggest, if possible, is to have, you know, a pair of, of shoes by your bed um, so that if an earthquake happens during the night, you can you know slip on your shoes and, and kind of move around without hurting your feet. Makes and also, sense. you know, keeping a torch, a, a flashlight uh, by the bed is also quite useful. It's a very good, useful, you know, tip to uh, not flicking the light switches after an earthquake. <laughs> Again, this is yeah, this is um, advice from the Tokyo government. But um, the reason for this is, you know, if in the worst case scenario. Um, this could spark a fire and explosion in some cases. Um, so the, the government here uh, suggests not flicking light switches unnecessarily uh, after earthquakes. Yeah. Well, this one is a given, but do not use the elevators. Yeah, again, this is quite tough because, you know, especially in Tokyo, we have so many high rise buildings. So, you know, if you live on the 30th floor, um, tough luck, you know, you, go, <laughs> you, uh, you should definitely Stairs. walk it um, and don't use elevators for, for obvious reasons. Right, and uh, I guess connected with uh, not flicking the light switches would be the fifth thing not to do, like, uh, do not use matches or lighter. Yeah, um, in the case of especially gas leaks, you know, there's always a fire risk. Um, so, yeah, we, we uh, recommend not to use matches or lighters. Um, in Japan, actually, the gas um, systems are built, designed so that in the event of a, of a big earthquake, all gas should shut off automatically in the house. Um, so in that sense, it's, you know, it's, it's a very good system. Um, but there's always, you know, that chance that there's uh, a gas leak somewhere. Right, that makes sense. And then related, inter interconnected would be do not reset your circuit breaker. Yes, yeah. Um, the, the key here is, you know, if, if uh, you try to restore, restore electricity to your house prematurely, uh, this could again start a fire explosion. Um, and if, if uh, you do head out to, let's say, an emergency shelter, um, we do recommend to turn off the electricity breaker before evacuating. So that you know, when electricity is restored, um, you can avoid fires breaking out. Right. Well, you know, like, these are such common sense uh, tips, and yet it's so hard and not to try any of them <laughs> you know, in the time of panic and emergency. So uh, it's always good to remind people. And uh, Robin. Uh, do you mind sharing with our viewers uh, the importance of having an emergency bag ready 
uh, at home and uh, perhaps at work. And why 72 hours provision is so crucial in time of emergencies? Sure. So the 72 hours uh, is, a, is a, after a major you know, catastrophe or incident is, is often seen as a very crucial period. And the reason for this is that for at least 72 hours, um, there will be no or there, there is likely to be very little help from the outside, especially in a major earthquake or tsunami scenario. Um, you know, you, you essentially have to be sufficient, self-sufficient for at least 72 hours. Um, and that includes, you know, things like, you know, medicine. Imagine if, if all, you know, the daily, you know, the uh, daily conveniences are unavailable, things like water, food, medicine, you know, glasses, you know, your asthma, medication, whatever it is, um, all of those things, um, we have to prepare for at least 72 hours um, so that we can kind of get over that, that crucial time period. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the lifelines, you know, electricity, water and gas, you know, I'm, again, I'm just giving the example of Tokyo. Um, in the event of a major earthquake happening here, um, there could be, you know, no um, electricity for seven days, no water, no running water for a month and no gas for two months, you know, potentially, if it's a major event. So, you know, if you think about, you know, how, where do I go to the toilet? You know, how do I feed my, you know, how do I cook, I feed my family? All these things, um, it does require a lot of, of thought. Um, but I think the key point here is it's, it's all a bit overwhelming if you think about, you know, how can I survive for, for two months without gas? You know, but I think the key point is if you if you just have a simple conversation with with the people in your in your household, you know, your loved ones, and you say, you know, if there's a hurricane, if there's an earthquake, where do we meet? Who do we call? You know, just having the basics in place makes such a big difference. Right, I, I agree. And uh, I can't believe that 30 minutes went by so quickly. And I hope that uh, this may be the first of many programs we can uh, do together. Um, I want to thank you so much for uh, being here today and talking to our viewers, but also for the amazing work that you do. Uh, not only in Japan, but across the globe uh, to advance uh, disaster management, you know, for so many uh, countries and uh, also in the area of climate uh, change. Um, and I hope you can make it to Hawaii soon so we can do this in person. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I'm, I'm uh, trying to get there as soon as possible. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Beatrice. Absolutely. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, darling. And uh, well, this concludes uh, our episode of uh, Perspectives on Global Justice for today. Uh, so be prepared, do not panic. I know it's a very hard um, concept to grasp, you know, in times of emergencies, but um, perhaps this program can be used as an inspiration for each one of our viewers to think individually and collectively as a community on how we can be better prepared and uh, also for our government to uh, support these efforts because as we have learned from Japan, community resiliency uh, is a big part of recovery and response and uh, we need to do this together. It's all interconnected, it's all interdependent. On that note, thank you so very much and I'll see you next Friday. I hope.